Evergreen Sermons Online in Pastor Michael Gabbert's series, Easter Seen and Unseen. This message from April 26, 2020 is entitled, Hidden in Plain Sight, citing Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. Good morning, church. Y'all stand with us in your homes and let's sing together great things.
unworthy of every song we could ever sing and worthy of all the praise we could ever bring and worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Coming to you Pondside this morning. Thank you for joining us. Let's say our verse for April together. Psalm 119, 37. Turn my eyes from looking at what is worthless. Give me life in your ways. Psalm 119, 37. You might not be aware we have paved the track all the way around our property and it's being enjoyed on a daily basis by hundreds of people. How about you come get some exercise on it too? We want to remind you that you need to contact us with any needs that we can help meet as a church family. 
We want to remind you to stay connected to your small groups in every way possible. Please remain faithful in your giving. You're doing a great job, family. And also remember you can pass on those incentive checks to help take care of needs that pop up within our church family and our community. For those of you joining us online who have not yet been on our campus, plan to join us at our church building as soon as possible. We'll let you know. We look forward to having you. Now let's get back to worship. Y'all stand back up with us. Let's sing Stand in Your Love this morning. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know No, I won't be shaken Oh, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love Oh, your perfect love And shame no longer has a place to hide And I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind no, I won't be shaken Oh, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love Oh, I stand in your 
seen what you can do Oh God of wonders Your power has no end The things you've done before In greater measure You will do again Cause there's no prison wall you can't break through No mountain you can't move All things are possible And there's no broken body you can't raise No, can't save All things are possible The darkest night you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, let hope arise, death is overcome, yes you've already won, God of revival, you rose in victory.
wall you can't break through, no mountain you can't move, all things are possible, and there's no broken body you can't raise, no soul that you can't save, all things are possible, all things are possible. We were waiting without 
praise you this morning. God, I thank you for your presence in this place. God, I pray that your spirit would meet each person in their homes today, God. Pray that you would speak through Pastor Michael today, God. It's in your name I pray. Amen. I didn't grow up in church. Uh, I went to church as a kid. Um, my brothers and sisters went. There was a bus that came around the neighborhood, and uh, my parents thought it was a great idea, so they shoved us off to church every Sunday morning. And I listened week after week, and, and uh, I was prompted one Sunday to respond, and I did. Um, got a Bible and got a nice talk and prayer and, and uh, went home, told my parents, and it was pretty uneventful. and. <clears throat> Um, but my life never changed or reflected um, the fact that I knew God. If I did the right things, God would accept me. And it was very much performance-based. My, my view and perspective of God, he was a supreme authority, but I really had no need for him uh, just in terms of day-to-day uh, -day life unless I was in trouble. Kind of uh, discovered for myself that work uh, was kind of the path for me. I jumped all in uh, and applied myself. And by the time I was 21, I bought a house. Uh, I was making more money than my dad at the time. And I thought, man, I, I got this thing figured out. I was prideful and arrogant and uh, self-sufficient. I got married uh, and then by the time I was 30, I was divorced. No matter what I was able to achieve, it never delivered on the promise. I just, there was emptiness at the end of each one of those things. Ashley uh, had befriended in third grade uh, a, a young lady. They became best friends, and her dad was pastor of a church. They came and got Ashley every Sunday, faithfully. And, and what happened was, I began to see her life really change. Those things that I knew I was missing, genuine love, joy. She had those things. I saw that in her. But as hard as she tried over about two years to get us to go with her, we never did. Just seeing the change in her life, she was only nine, but the joy that she had the time she spent in the Word without her parents prompting her. Uh, and then our world got rocked pretty good. Uh, Gina's dad, Russ, uh, was diagnosed with brain cancer. When he passed away, and it happened fairly quickly, and I watched over that time, her, her, the peace that she had in all of that. One Sunday at church, she'd had enough, and God had broke through, and she surrendered her life. So some time went by, uh, and one night we were making dinner together, and, and I just I just felt like a ton of bricks was on me. And, and I, I opened up to Gina, and I shared with her what God was doing in my heart. She broke down crying. I broke down crying. And uh, that changed everything. Our lives, just God just changed us from the inside out. Surrender your life to Jesus and make him Lord of your life. It isn't enough to know who he is. Jesus is in the business of transforming life from the inside out. I'm proof of that. Jesus is in the business of transforming life from the inside out. You've heard stories over the last six weeks from different people in our church, and, and it's just a taste of the reality of what God is doing and has already done, what he continues to do in the way of transformation among the people of Evergreen. I'm glad you're here this morning. I, I'm glad you're somewhere this morning. Uh, you're not here. 
Uh, I can't see you and I miss you desperately. But I want us to just redeem this time and, and see what we can find in the Word of God that has something to say for us. Six weeks we've been doing this, and I started a series on that first Sunday called Easter, Seen and Unseen. And we've gone from the anointing by Mary of Jesus the night before the cross um, all the way through Easter those resurrection appearances and the ascension last week. This morning I want us to look in the second chapter of Acts because I want to look at uh, the beginning of the church. I really think what started in that upper room the night before the cross went through Easter weekend with the, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, his resurrection to prove that, that uh, atonement had been made, for, forgiveness of sins was available, that death no longer has a hold on us, all the way through those resurrection appearances, the celebration and worship at his ascension that we looked at last week. I, I want you to see that the church is the natural conclusion of that Easter story. Uh, it, it is, uh, it's an extraordinary thing in my mind when I run across people who tell me that they believe in Jesus, that they, that they believe in God, that, they, uh, that they're Christians, but they're not uh, church people. I don't understand that. I, I, I seriously don't. I don't know how you can read the Word of God and not see the church as God unfolding the invisible and finally making it visible. In fact, this lesson is entitled The Hidden, the hidden Among the, the, the Visible, The Hidden Among the, what is it called? Hidden in Plain Sight. Hidden in plain sight. See, you got to have a team to lead a church. Hidden in Plain Sight, that's a great title. I wish I'd thought of it. Uh, it's the idea that that God has taken all the work that he's been doing, everything that we've seen from, from what Mary saw the night before the cross that nobody else seemed to be able to, to interpret, to what happened on the cross in that invisible conversation that Jesus had with the Father, to, to uh, the opening of the tomb on Easter Sunday morning, those appearances leading to the ascension, all of that in a very real sense was hidden to the world at large and revealed only to specific people or groups of people along the way as God was moving this forward until we get to the church. And now the reality of Easter is put on display by this thing called the church. Now, the way we use the word church uh, adds to the confusion of, of what I'm talking about. And I, I want to I show you some pictures. Uh, last summer, uh, I was on sabbatical. We traveled in Europe, and, and I want to show you a couple of the pictures that I took while we were there. Here we go. There we go. There we go. This church is, is called uh, the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore, and it's in Florence, Italy. It's the third largest church building in the world. It is an extraordinary structure that just captivated me from the outside and from the inside, filled with beautiful artwork and, and, and sculptures. It's an, it's an incredible experience, okay? From, from there, we traveled uh, later in our trip, we were in Rome, and the second picture is, is, the, is the cathedral, uh, no, the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. It is a church built what, what was outside of the original walls of Rome 2,000 years ago, it signifies the place where uh, the Apostle Paul, as a Roman citizen, would have been taken outside the walls of the city to be executed. It was a powerful and moving place for me to visit uh, because of, of the significance of that location and, and the execution of, of the Apostle Paul. This third picture... Uh, you may recognize this is one side of St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City in Rome. This is the headquarters of Roman Catholicism around the world. It is the largest church building on the planet. Now here's the thing about, about all of these. 
I love visiting these church buildings. I love the, the artwork and the, um, the sculptures. It, it was really incredible. But this was the last one that, that we visited. And, and honestly, as long as I could look at these buildings as museums, I was okay. I could treat it as a museum and I could, I could look at the, the precious possessions that, that were, were on display there and I was okay. But it was when I began to, to realize that these were supposed to be churches that my spirit just began to, to break my heart because of what I saw in these places. I saw, uh, I saw a church defined by architecture, defined by art and, and possessions. Honestly, uh, St. Peter's in, in Rome is, is one of the gaudiest, over-the-top, pl- St. Peter is spinning in his grave that this is named after him. Well, we have church buildings in this country, but nothing to compare to that. But the reality is, people drive by the church buildings located on virtually every intersection in the city of Tulsa, and most of the time, I think they don't even really give notice to them because where at least in Europe, the buildings themselves have some sort of appeal architecturally or artistically, I get that. But, but the essence of a church, if it's limited to its building, there's no, there's no draw to the building. There's no power in the building. I've discovered, even, in, even on the Evergreen campus, Obviously, I've been here from the very beginning. I I was here when we just owned 40 acres of grass. And to see what God has done here has been extraordinary. And I've always loved this place. It's it's a happy place for me. But I got to tell you, the last six weeks have made me realize that this is a happy place because of the people. I mean, right now, I might as well be preaching to you from a barn. I mean, this is... This is a beautiful building, but there's no appeal to me. There's no, there's no attraction to me in this place without the people. You see, for all these grand buildings that we visited in, in Europe and for all of the impressive churches that, that we think we have in, in, in this country and, and even in this city, The reality is, it's never been the building that God means to put on display. What he's putting on display in the life of a church is his presence, his power in his people. We are the church. And what only Mary saw the night before the cross, what what only a handful saw as Jesus was nailed to those bars, what, what only a few were privileged to see on that Easter Sunday morning, what only a collection of, uh, of followers were allowed to, to, to observe during those resurrection appearances, all of that is now meant to be on display in us. What was hidden is made clear in us. We are the conclusion, if you will, of the Easter story. So join me in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we have the description of the birth of the church. And the early verses of the chapter show that the church had gathered together in prayer and the Holy Spirit comes, he makes himself known, he he takes up residence in the lives of every individual believer. But there's something dramatic about that. We often, we often read those early verses of, of Acts chapter 2, and we, we put it in an individualistic context because we're Americans, and that's the way we look at the world. And we see the Holy Spirit coming, and he filled up the believers, and then they went out, and they, they practiced evangelism. 
But, but what I want us to capture today is that what was happening there was not just a series of individual transactions between the Spirit of God and individual parts of the church. What was happening was he was not only filling individuals with the power to live the life that they've been invited to live in Christ, but he was creating a people that, that would become something distinctive in order to put that reality, that invisible presence on display in every generation for the last 2,000 years. We didn't invent anything at Evergreen. We have received this legacy of the gospel, and we're just the latest version, the latest iteration of putting this Easter story on display, not in some sort of cantata that we do once a year or, or Easter skit. Putting Easter on display in that the power that caused Easter is the power that lives out through us in our daily life. But Christianity is not a, a random collection of individuals. It is a communal event, and that something, that people, was created in this chapter. Now, the Holy Spirit comes in the, in the early verses and and they go out and they begin to witness to the crowds that have gathered in Jerusalem for the Jewish holiday that is called Pentecost. That's the, the Greek name for the holiday. Peter stands up to preach. And think of the, think of the irony there. Peter stands up in public to preach to thousands of people. We know his audience must have included thousands of people because we're going to find out that 3,000 out of that audience came to follow Jesus that day through the power of God flowing through Peter. This is the same Peter preaching to thousands of people in a public setting, the same Peter that just six weeks before cursed the name of Christ because he was afraid of a uh, uh, of a young milkmaid who was serving him at a sidewalk cafe. What a difference six weeks makes. No, what a difference the Spirit of God living in a man makes. Every story that you've heard over the last six weeks, every testimony coming out of our church family has essentially been a story of the difference that, that happens, the transformation that takes place when the Spirit of God first takes up residence in a life. Well, I wish we could do the entire second chapter of Acts, but we would literally be here for hours, maybe days. So we're going to look at the closing verses of this chapter. The first verses, the Spirit comes, the, the, the church praying together really becomes something that they had not been before. They were a collection of people who wanted to follow Jesus before. Now they have a supernatural bond. We're going to look at that. And they flood out of this, this upper room where they've been praying. They go and share their faith with people in the crowd. Peter stands up to preach, and we see the numbers come together. Uh, 3,000 come to Christ that day. And the closing verses of this chapter are going to give us a summary of, of what happens from there about this new thing called the church, this body of Christ living out the reality of his power and presence in us individually and communally, corporately. And these verses will, will give us a picture of what Evergreen should look like in 2020. So, Go to verse 41, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. The verse is the conclusion of Peter's sermon, and it simply summarizes by saying, So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. It's a verse that tells us that there was an invisible power creating a people. There's a direct correlation in this chapter between the proclamation of truth and the repentance of people. That's one of the reasons why I'm so disappointed when I, when I run across pastors who, who, who decide that there are other things more important for them to preach than, uh, than, than the Bible. It's the proclamation of truth that leads people to the place of making decisions that allows the Spirit of God to take up residence and to, um, 
uh, and to see their lives transformed. There's a close connection here between baptism and being a part of the church. They were baptized immediately and they came into the church. The church was, uh, at, at its core definition, the church is an invisible uh, power that creates some a, a definition, a, an identity of a people that could not be there otherwise. You see, we could build a building and we could invite people to join and we could do service projects. In fact, there are organizations that do those things. We call them service organizations. The Kiwanis Club, the Lions Club, the, those kinds of places ha are, are, are fine and they're, they're, they're just fine. But the Kiwanis Club and the Lions Club, they will do service projects that help a community but lives cannot be ultimately transformed from the inside out by participation in some sort of secular community service organization. There is in the church, by definition, the invisible power of God, and he is changing the lives of people. He changes them in the context. That's why this, that's why this six weeks has been so... Uh, so awful in a sense for for us because he changes us he works in us not just individually in isolation he, he he transforms us within the connection that we have with each other we are made better by being together we are a people the people of god because easter power is among us. There are probably collections of church members in places that are doing fine. Church is uh, just another one of the things on their list that, that's not available to them right now. And, and if they get back to it, it'll be, it'll be okay. They'll, they'll build it back into their schedule if they have time for it. There are probably people who view church that way. That's not us. Part of the reason we yearn to be together so much is because of this awareness that what God does in our lives is, is more effective. It, it works through us better in the context that we share with our church family. See, that, that's the thing. The, I, I've said the invisible power creates a, a people. But, but that, what's amazing about that people is that they quickly become family. There's an invisible bond in Christ that creates a family. Look at the, the beginning in verse 42, the next, uh, the next part of this chapter. There are several things here that, uh, that I want to call attention to. And, and we'll start with what I've called shared life experiences. Um, verse 42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, all of those activities in this context are, are communal activities. Now, I know prayer is something that you can do in your quiet time, in your prayer closet. It's something that you can do in isolation. But this verse is talking about prayer time that is shared together with the people of God. This verse describes what it was like to be in this brand new thing that had never existed before that was called the church. They devoted themselves. The word means that there was an absolute commitment to these things. This wasn't something they did if they had time. This wasn't something that they, that they built in to their schedule if they could work it out. They were absolutely committed to these things. Listen, I, maybe this is a time to say it because, because we're, we're not all here together and, and I think that we, we want to be. But as a pastor, it always throws me for a loop when I talk to people who, who have church way down their list of priorities. Listen, I, 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 know, I know your kids want to play sports, but, but I, it, honestly, it bothers me when soccer tournaments and softball tournaments and competitive baseball and, and, and all of those kinds of activities, when they, when they play on Sunday mornings 
and, and you take the kids to be in the sporting event, what you're telling your children is that church is optional. Now, maybe you've given birth to the next great Hall of Famer in whatever sport your kid plays, but chances are um, the eternal impact of playing in sports versus the eternal impact of being at church, man, that, there's, there's not even a, a comparison there. These people, they were devoted to certain shared activities that defined being the church. I hope that you're watching this morning, wherever you happen to be, because while you could have been doing other things, there's a devotion in you, a yearning to be a part of something. And even though technology is kind of a, a sad substitute for, for what we really want, we want to all be together in, in this room on this campus. We want, we want children experiencing uh, Bible teaching with, with people who, who care deeply about them. We want Bible study in groups. We want to share prayer requests face to face. We want to hug each other and, and, and shake hands. We want, to, we want to be in that context. Not just because we don't have anything else to do on a Sunday morning, but because we're devoted to the shared experience of the, of the life of the church. Let me ask you, are you devoted, not a member, I didn't ask you if you were a member, are you devoted to what we share together? Here it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that is the corporate setting where where the, the, a senior pastor, a, 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 an elder of the church, uh, teaches from the Word of God, they were devoted to the fellowship. That is, to being together, to living life side by side. They were devoted to that. It wasn't that they just had a circle of friends that happened to be Christian. It's that that was family. Even in this quarantine, it's interesting that while, while the government says, well, let's limit the size of gatherings to, to just 10 or less, they've turned around and said, but families, families can be together. Why? Because there's this intangible reality that sets family relationship apart from every other casual acquaintance relationship that we have. Well, God transforms us supernaturally into family. And when it says they were devoted to the fellowship, it meant that they, they were willing to change their schedules if necessary in order to be together because fellowship was a critical definition of who they were as the people of, of, of Christ. They were devoted to the breaking of bread. Now, there's some question about whether this has to do with, uh, with the, the Lord's Supper uh, or, or just uh, hospitality. I tend to lean in the direction of hospitality. Because they were devoted to the fellowship, being together with the body, that played out in the practical reality. They were devoted to sharing hospitality with each other the rest of the time. In other words, church for them was not a Sunday morning experience that was then put on hold until the next Sunday morning rolled around. Church for them involved the sharing of life throughout the week with those people who were supernaturally defined as family. They were devoted to time together, both at church, if you will, and outside of church, just doing life together. And they were devoted to prayer. One of the things that has always made Evergreen an extraordinary place is that we have a men's prayer breakfast that's more than 20 years old. Men's events in the life of most churches have uh, a pretty brief shelf life. Um, men do something for a while and, and it kinda, they kind of lose interest and, and, and it, it goes away and then they do something else and, and then they do something else. And, and so men's ministry tends to be um, uh, kind of a cycle of trying to get the next thing that will, that will connect men, that will, that will draw men into involvement. Uh, we haven't had that problem here because we have men before this quarantine, usually somewhere between 50 or 60 men every week devoted to being together, 
to standing together, to praying together, because that was, by definition, who we are as expressions of the power of Christ in us, making us family. The church shared life together. It's, it's one of the, the, the basic characteristics of what makes a real church. Church is not assembling for an hour or an hour and a half on Sunday mornings and then not thinking about that event until the next time it rolls around. Church is people transformed by the Spirit of God who are doing life together, hand in hand, arm in arm, day by day. Not just those shared experiences, but also look at the awe-inspired worship. Look at verse 43. It says, everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Filled with awe. When does that happen? Awe is something that happens in the life of a church when we become alert to the work of God in the lives of people. I have people ask me... um, way too often, why doesn't the modern church have signs and wonders like the early church? Are you kidding me? I mean, the six testimonies that you've seen over the last six Sunday mornings are evidences of signs and wonders. That is God doing something dramatic. There is nothing more dramatic than, than, than the Easter reality of Jesus coming out of a tomb and moving from death to life. That Easter reality is played out over and over and over again in the lives of the people who make up this church because we were dead and we came out of death into life. There is no sign or wonder more impressive than that. The reality is that people are different because they've been here, because God has met them here, because he's made them to be different people. There are people in this church that when they first walked through the doors and I met them for the first time, they were just shopping. They were just here because they needed a place to, to, to connect with on a, on a kind of casual basis and, uh, and they wanted to be respectable. And I've seen God do works in their lives that bring them to the place where now they are deep in the heart of what happens here. They are serving without expectation of recognition. They are helping without anybody else knowing. They are giving in ways that would, that would turn heads and yet they don't ask for anybody to know. Why is that happening? Those are signs and wonders because someone sort of condescendingly favorable toward God has come in and experienced God in a real way and they are being changed, transformed. I know I've used that word several times. I can't think of a, of a, of a word that, that, that makes more sense. We're talking about being one thing and then the power of God transforming us until we're something else. Listen, Part of the reason I'm, 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 I'm trying to show you these testimonies is because you should look at the people in these stories and there should be a little bit of awe at the signs and wonders of change, of new life, of transformation that's being happening there. We could do a dozen testimonies a week and still not capture all that God is doing among a people called Evergreen. Signs and wonders, they're everywhere. Most often in the lives of people. You know, you remember that, that, that story in the Gospels when four friends brought their friend who was lame to Jesus and And they couldn't get in because the crowds were so large. And so they they took his cot up onto the roof and they broke through probably a thatched roof that, that was a part of that house. And they lowered him by rope down so that he was laying on his cot right there in front of Jesus. Now, now that's some determination to get to get a friend to Jesus. 
But Jesus does the strangest thing. He assesses that situation. He has a conversation with the man on the cot, and he says, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees who are, who are in the room taking up space that should have been reserved for people who actually wanted to worship Jesus, the Pharisees lose their minds. Whoa, 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 you, you, can't, you can't forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. Well, that's sort of the point. But, but beside that, Jesus asked them this interesting question. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise up from your bed and walk? And he says, just so that you know I have the authority to say the first thing, I'm going to say the second thing. And he looks at the guy and he says, listen, collect your stuff and, and walk on out of here. And he does. And everybody is shocked and stunned and, and speechless. In, 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 in other words, they were in awe. But see, here's the, here's the problem. We tend to think that signs and wonders need to be those kinds of things that you can measure, that you can observe. That crowd was more impressed in that moment that a lame man could get up and walk out of the building. They were more impressed with that than they were impressed that Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. I have authority. I've just secured your eternal destiny. We have the exact same flaw in our approach to spiritual things 2,000 years later. Because we say, well, well, how come there's no signs and wonders? And what we mean is we want God to do parlor tricks. We want him to do some stuff that we can go, wow, that, you know, he, he, he said take a card and, and you picked a card and, and he knew what your card was and we're, we're so stunned by that. We want God to be a magician and show off for us when the signs and wonders that ought to, ought to drop our jaws into speechlessness are the changes that happen in the lives of the people that we know. And we knew what they were, and we know what they are now, and we know that the only explanation is the power, the Easter power, the resurrection power of God in them. And we should be in awe. If you know the people of Evergreen, you should be in awe every time you step onto this campus because every life is a story of signs and wonders of God doing something extraordinary. They worshiped because they had such an awareness that the power of God, the Easter resurrection power of God was at work in the lives of the people who made up the church. Man, they shared life together. They had awe-inspired worship. They participated in ministry. Look at verses 44 and 45. It says, Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, we could get sidetracked on on this, this verse because um, there, are, there are a lot of people in, in our generation that, that use these verses as a proof text to make the argument that Jesus was a socialist, that the church um, put everything together. They, they, they had one big uh, pile and, uh, and they gave everything and it was distributed by those who were in authority. That's absolutely not what's happening here. And that's not what Luke is suggesting in these writings. He was saying, when he, when he was saying that they held all things in common, what they meant was they recognized that everything that each one of them had was, was actually owned by God. They had been given stewardship responsibility over certain parts of the things that belong to God. It's a powerful thing in the life of a church when the church has settled the ownership issue for, for material resources. When we understand that God owns what we have and he has allowed us to have the responsibility of stewarding or managing those resources. When it says they held everything in common, it doesn't mean they brought everything and the, and the disciples, like a televangelist, all of a sudden had everybody's money. It means that everything was available to meet the needs of everybody 
because they understood that it belonged to God. And as there were needs identified, those who had the steward responsibility, the management responsibility, would bring a portion of what God owned and make it available to meet the need. You see, this is ministry that is done from participation. Ministry in the 20th century in the church is too often done with, with, what, with the things that we consider to be extra. We bring clothes that we don't need because somebody can, need them, can, can use them. And we bring shoes that we don't need and, and, and we, we do these things. And those aren't bad. I mean, it is good to not waste those things when there are other people that can use them. But what he's describing here is not a, a process where the church just used their extra stuff that they didn't need to help other people. They had an attitude that says, everything I have been given belongs to God and he's given it to me specifically for the responsibility of how to distribute it according to his priorities. You see, I, when, when, I make, when I put money in investments, I give my money to someone who goes and he invests that money on my behalf. But, when I, but I give him the instructions on how to do that. I tell him how I want that money used. I don't just give him the money and then he runs off and does whatever he wants to do. He follows my instructions. When God gives us resources, and, and it's an illusion if you say, well, well, I work hard for my paycheck. Yeah, actually you work hard because you're trying to honor the Lord in the way you live your life. Your paycheck is God's gracious gift to you that allows you to do the things that he's called you to do. And that includes making those resources available at his instruction to meet the needs that you see around you that can be met with what he's put in your hands. That's what was happening in the church here. They did ministries, but they were participatory ministries. They, they had sweat equity. They, they got in and they gave out of what God had put in their hands so that there were no needs left unmet in the church. This is the whole concept behind the 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 stimulation the the stimulus um, payments that are coming we've seen so many great and and I know I know that you're responding to this because a lot uh, most of those donations that have come into that account are in twelve hundred dollar increments so you're not holding back you're you're giving but it's a statement that God has put this in my hand and there are needs that that. Are, that need to be met, and this is a way that I can help do that. I can be, be fiscally involved in making life better for people who are in our family that have been negatively impacted by what's happening today. This was a part of the church. It wasn't an extra part. It wasn't for only those who were super committed. It was the normal lifestyle of that early church. Verse 46 says that they were involved in mentoring and, and sharing fellowship. Verse 46, it says, Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts. You see, every day when they met together in the temple, what were they doing? Well, they were worshiping some as a, as a, as a crowd, but, but really they didn't go to the temple and assemble and have corporate worship. That's, that, that's, that's the, the temple was a place for the Jewish rituals and most of this early church in Jerusalem had Jewish uh, heritage and so they were still participating in the temple. But what were they actually doing as Christians there? They were mentoring, they were discipling, they were meeting together one-on-one, one-on-two, -on -one, one-on-three, and they were walking through the reality of the life that, that they were now living together. They were learning how to follow Jesus, how to be Christ-like. They were teaching one another how to study the scriptures. They were doing all of those things that we do in discipleship, in mentoring. You need to have that kind of relationship because while what we do corporately with hundreds of people gathered together for worship, while that is truly a significant part of this life that we share, 
The corporate event on Sunday morning is not the only thing that you're called to. They were devoted to this as well, this kind of relationship of give and take where they learn together how to live this life. They broke bread from house to house, that's fellowship, and they ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts. Man, if that's not a description of a people called Evergreen, I don't know what is. Well, there's an invisible power creating a people. That power turns a people into a family that shares an invisible bond. But then at that point, it becomes a visible passion which creates impact. You see, all of those things that God is doing to transform us to change us, to make us internally different than what we once were. Well, now he's left us here in the world in our generation because for the first time, what Mary saw the night before the cross, what John saw at the foot of the cross that day when Jesus spoke to him, what what the disciples saw on Easter morning and, and through the resurrection appearances, All of those things that were kept sort of under wraps, God is now putting resurrection power on display because he's not only transforming us, he's not only changing us, shaping us within the context of the church, but he's leaving us here to go out and put that power on display everywhere we go. We are finally the visible expression of all that invisible power that has been unfolding in the Easter story. It says in a summary verse, in verse 47, they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Three things that were happening there. They were praising God. Man, worship and and the celebration of who they were as the people of God, that was a daily lifestyle. A few times over the years, uh, I've had people that that leave the church for one reason or another. and, And one of the standard reasons, if you ask them why they're leaving, I mean, this is just, this is just so normal now. I think people don't even think it through. As they as they as they leave the church, they'll say, "Well, well, we just we just aren't being fed here." Well, here's the problem with that. Um, number one, I'm doing my best to feed you as best I can, but number two, I'm only feeding you a couple of times a week at best. But what I'm trying to do is model how to use the Word of God, what we do in our mentoring, our discipling as we teach you how to feed yourself. I have a six or seven month old grandbaby visiting at my house right now, and she's a delight. But guess what? Every time she eats, you gotta feed her. She doesn't know how to feed herself. Oh, she knows how to grab the food and make a mess, but she doesn't know how to feed herself. But if she was 10 years old and we were still feeding her, we'd say something's wrong here. Part of the proof of her healthy growth as a child is that at some point along the way, she's gonna learn how to use a spoon and she's gonna learn how to feed herself and she's gonna be able to eat a graham cracker and she's gonna be able to drink out of a cup. And we're gonna look at that and we're gonna say, well, That's no big deal, that's just the way things happen. But it's a transformation that will allow her to take nourishment into herself without having to be spoon-fed by somebody else for her whole life. The spiritual life is exactly the same way. Here, it says that they were praising God and, and, and it was a lifestyle. 
It wasn't just a Sunday event. It was a day-by-day walking with Jesus. They learned how to feed themselves. They learned from their corporate time together on Sunday in Sunday worship, and they learned in their discipleship relationships with one another. They learned how to feed themselves. But then it says, and they had favor with all the people. Let me tell you, this is critical to this whole process because God de- designed the church to put resurrection power on display and the natural result of that is generally that those around see that power being played out. They see us being transformed into Christ's likeness and it gives the church a positive reputation in the community. And that positive reputation ends up being the very appealing uh, draw that, that, that invites people to come into a place where they can see the source of that transformation, where they can discover Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us in John chapter 12, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. Do you know that as the church of Jesus Christ, our daily responsibility is very simple and straightforward. Oh, you've got a long to-do list of things. I, I get that. You've got to go to work and, and you, have, you have errands to run. You have all of those things. But all of that is just the stuff of life. But what's your mission in life? Simply put, it is this. To lift up Jesus Christ and put him on display. That's all you have to do. You lift him up. He says, if I'm lifted up, if you do your part, I will draw men to myself. We see that happening in the early church because it says, and the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. Guess what they were doing? They didn't have a sales pitch. They didn't have a script that they had memorized. They weren't going out and making cold calls and knocking on doors of strangers and and, and trying to tell them uh, some sales pitch about religion. They were simply praising God as a daily habit of life. And that lifestyle of following Jesus was giving them a good reputation in the community. And as they lived their life of lifting up Jesus and putting him on display, Jesus was drawing them to himself. And that is people every day were coming into the church because of what they could see in the lives of God's people. The power has been invisible all through the Easter story. It's an invisible power. It's a hidden power. Now that power is in us. And for the first time, it is visible. It is on display. And people are drawn to Jesus because they see him at work in us. Let me read you something that I found recently. I've read you some ancient documents before, but um, this is one that, that I ran across that, uh, that I hadn't seen before. Uh, this is written by uh, a, a secular philosopher by the name of Aristides. He, he lived in the early second century, so Christianity is not quite a hundred years old. It has infiltrated throughout the, the Roman Empire And he is writing to the emperor to make a report on this people called Christians. Um, Now, you've seen some of this before, but this is is a a different writing. Um, It it was published in, the document is called The Apology of Aristides, and it was translated in English for the first time in 1893. Let me, let, me, let me read this uh, document. Remember, this is not a Christian. This is a, a, a secular philosopher who's reporting on what his research has discovered about Christians, and he's giving this to the emperor. Now, the Christians, O king, by going about and seeking, have found the truth. For they know and trust in God, the maker of heaven and earth, who has no fellow. From him they received those commandments which they have engraved on their minds and which they observe in the hope and expectation of the world to come. For this reason, 
They do not commit adultery or immorality. They do not bear false witness or embezzle, nor do they covet what is not theirs. They honor father and mother and do good to those who are their neighbors. Whenever they are judges, they judge uprightly. They do not worship idols made in the image of man. Whatever they do not wish that others should do to them, they in turn do not do. And they do not eat the food sacrificed to idols. Those who oppress them, they exhort and make them their friends. They do good to their enemies. Their wives, O king, are pure as virgins and their daughters are modest. Their men abstain from all unlawful sexual contact and from impurity in the hope of recompense that is to come in another world. As for their bondsmen and bondwomen and their children, if there are any, they persuade them to become Christians and when they have done so, they call them brethren without distinction. They refuse to worship strange gods and they go their own way in all humility and cheerfulness. Falsehood is not found among them. They love one another. The widow's needs are not ignored and they rescue the orphan from the person who does him violence. He who has gives to him who has not ungrudgingly and without boasting. When the Christians find a stranger, they bring him to their homes and rejoice over him as a true brother. They do not call brothers those who are bound by blood ties alone, but those who are brethren after the Spirit and in God. When one of their poor passes away from the world, each provides for his burial according to his ability. If they hear of any of their number who are imprisoned or oppressed for the name of the Messiah, they all provide for his needs, and if it is possible to redeem him, they set him free. If they find poverty in their midst and they do not have spare food, they fast two or three days in order that the needy might be supplied with the necessities. They observe scrupulously the commandments of their Messiah, living honestly and soberly as the Lord their God ordered them. Every morning and every hour they praise and thank God for his goodness to them, and for their food and drink they offer thanksgiving. If any righteous person of their number passes away from the world, they rejoice and thank God and escort his body as if he were setting out from one place to another nearby. When a child is born to one of them, they praise God. If it dies in infancy, they thank God the more for, as for one who has passed through the world without sins. But if one of them dies in his iniquity or in his sins, they grieve bitterly and sorrow as over one who is about to meet his doom. Such, O king, is the commandment given to the Christians, and such is their conduct. When the secular people who don't know the resurrection Easter power of Jesus Christ, when they speak well of the church, we know that in our generation, the hidden is finally being put on display. And if we lift up Christ, we can trust that he'll draw men to himself. If you need to speak with one of our pastors, stay tuned and see the information that we're going to present. Next week, we'll continue to worship online, just like we're doing. I'm going to begin a new teaching series on the life of Moses. It's entitled, Walking with the Invisible God. You can start by reading Exodus chapter 1 and looking at the similarities between a world that Moses lived in where human life was cheap and the world that we live in in 2020. We'll start that adventure in the book of Exodus next Sunday. As we remain scattered, we miss being together. But in our dispersion, may we no less be the church lifting up Jesus, putting him on display so that the world around us will make their way to the master. In Jesus' name, amen.
On behalf of Evergreen Church, I want to welcome you to our live stream this morning. We are so excited that you've chosen to join us today. If you'd like to get connected to our community or if you're new to Evergreen, I want to encourage you to join us on our website, evergreenbc.org. You can also find us on social media by searching for evergreen.tulsa. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and on Twitter. If you've made a decision this morning and you'd like to speak to one of our pastors, you can easily connect to our staff through our website by searching through the, the messaging function. We are so excited that you've chosen to join us here today. We want to encourage you to come back again and see us when we open soon. Thank you and God bless. Jesus is risen. You crush the power of hell.